Well, hello again. It is the Line Podcast. We are recording May the 23rd, 2024. Great to have Jen back in Calgary, but of course she's leaving the country again immediately. So we'll talk about that in a moment. Uh, coming up in the podcast, so lots of big things to talk about. Justin Trudeau will channel the clash, folks. Will he stay or will he go? Also, we're going to be talking about the situation with the international rules-based order. I have thoughts about that. And finally, arguing about makeup in Parliament. <sighs> All that and more on the latest episode of The Line Podcast. This episode of The Line has been brought to you by Unsmoke Canada. Canada can be a global leader in reducing the harm caused by smoking, but it requires actionable steps, including giving adult smokers the information they need to choose potentially less harmful alternatives. Learn more at unsmoke.ca. Well, hello, Jen Gerson. I see you're back in Calgary. Uh, how was your trip to the States? Uh, absolutely fantastic. Got to meet with lots of very interesting people in the United States, networking, doing stuff, meeting people. Uh, so yeah, I'm here for a solid four days. That's why we're early recording. And now I'm back to do another trip to the United States for another totally different unrelated topic. Yeah, um, yeah we are just it's worth mentioning. We are recording this again a day early. This is being recorded on Thursday, the 23rd. And I don't know why I keep forgetting what day it is, but it is the 23rd. As before, Lime Podcast listeners, if we miss a big news story on Friday, don't blame us. It's a beautiful Thursday evening. We did push it as late as possible. But yeah, we're recording this on a Thursday. Which brings me back to the next major event that I have on my calendar, because I won't even be home very long after I'm back from my next trip, because we are going to be meeting with all of our great friends in Edmonton for Is Canada Prepared for the Next Inevitable Economic S-H-I-T storm. Uh, we're going to have great panelists, Chris Reagan from the Max Bell School of Public Policy. We're going to have Lisa Wright. If you're into politics, you will recognize that name. And we're going to have economist Trevor Toome on hand with both, both Matt and I in the uh, downtown Edmonton Public Library. They have a, a theater, a Mutart theater in the basement of that library. We're going to have drinks. We're going to have canapes. We're going to have meet and greets. We're going to have discussions. It's actually going to be a super fun event. So if you are in the Edmonton area, do consider not only liking and subscribing, but go to the uh, description area of this particular video and check out our event bright link. See you there. Looking forward See to it. There. All right, let's jump into it. I think let's just state our biases right up front. Okay, My let's go. Bet... Wait, 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 wait. Let's ask, let's ask the question. What are we asking right now? The question is, will Justin Trudeau be liberal leader for the next election? Okay. I think he will be. Okay. I, I don't I don't know what you think. And I, I can I can make the argument both ways. I get it. It's controversial and undecided for a reason. But I think he likely will be, with one possible glaring exception. I'll get into it in a minute. But first, what's your take? Who my leads take, the Liberals into the next election? Okay, my take is that I don't think that it is possible to predict who exactly is going to lead the Liberals into the next election. I do think it's possible to ask whether or not Justin Trudeau will quit of his own free will. And my answer to that question is no. I don't think that he's going to quit uh, quit willingly. So I think that that is probably my bias going into this. That's my assumption. That's where I'm kind of that's that's my north my north pole on this particular t subject. Mm -hmm. But I first want to talk about why we're talking about this right now. Sure. Uh, I know there's been lots of speculation about whether or not Justin Trudeau, you know, he's managed to ride through an absolutely sustained twenty point. Um, I should say this gap between yep, it, his popularity yep. and, and Pierre Polyev. It's now very clear that that's not a blip. It's now very clear that single policy measures are not going to make up that blip. The, the, the budget's not going to make up that blip. And we now, as we've discussed in a previous podcast, have the liberals um, basically frantically smashing the abortion button, hoping yeah. to scare the hell out of people um, into coming around back to their, their liberal hometown kind of thing. Uh, and I don't think it's moving the dial at all. And I think it's worth discussing why it's not moving the dial at all. But this has been an ongoing discussion, an, an ongoing matter of of, of, of of subject matter discussion. People have been like, well, you know, how does how does leaders stay on with a 20 point gap? That is that's not recoverable. That's not soluble. He obviously has to go. Uh, I don't think that he does. But we're, we're talking about it right now because you have Tom Mulcair, who's the former leader of the NDP, going on CTV, making the case for Justin Trudeau 
going and how Mark Carney is the obvious successor and how the CPC is terrified of Mark Carney. Mark Carney, probably best known to Canadians as being a former Bank of Canada governor. Mm -hmm. um, he also spent some time uh, as the UK um, Bank of Canada governor, or sorry, the UK. Bank of England. Bank of England. Yeah. Thank you. Different country. There you go. Um, uh, governor as well. So, I mean, he is, he is uh, obviously very professional, highly regarded in professional and Bay Street circles. Um, absolute peak Laurentian consensus avatar for that particular kind of class and power structure, I would say. Um, and it makes perfect sense to me why liberals who don't understand why they're failing would think that he was their savior. Matt, did I just steal that line from you? I did steal that line from you. I'm you sorry. Totally stole that line. I, um, I, I, I give full, I give you full credit. It just, it was there. I took it. My delivery would have been much more bombastic though. Look, <laughs> well, my delivery was, I don't have strong personal feelings about Mark Carney. I know we live in, a, in an age of, of very fiery political rhetoric. I don't really have strong feelings about most of these people as people. So I don't have a strong view of Mark Carney as human being. But I think that given the mood of the electorate today, given the reasons why the liberals are somewhere between 15 and, and 20 or more points back in the polls, Putting in Mark Carney does not address the weaknesses, and it may, in fact, magnify the, uh, the, the it, does, it doesn't add strength and it may add weaknesses. And I have been watching a debate internally among liberals. And one of the things I've noticed, not with 100 percent overlap, but pretty close, is that the liberals who are the most passionate for. Mark Carney are the ones who seem to have the least understanding of why Justin Trudeau is 15 or 20 points back. Mm -hmm. And if they, they do replace him with Mark Carney, okay. Like, okay. Like a fresh face that that probably would help, but does it start winning ridings that the liberals are currently on track to lose? No, I don't see it. I do. But Matt, I Matt wanna... devil's advocate. Mm -hmm. The reason why people don't like Trudeau is because they've all been misled by successive amounts of misinformation and disinformation over the period of the last 10 years. So obviously, if you just put take him away from the picture and replace him with someone who's highly respectable and highly liked by these very same circles of people who have been supporting Justin Trudeau for, for this amount of time, that will solve the problem, will it not? I'm skeptical. <laughs> like, I... I, I want what I would love to read. And if anyone out there wants to write it for us, we would happily publish it. I would like to read the case for Mark Carney as liberal leader, but specifically through the lens of how he improves on Justin Trudeau. Okay. So, and I have not really seen that argument made and liberals have over the years had a bit of a savior complex at times which is well this times. didn't work we'll go with this guy this guy didn't work we'll go with the next one i think i i have identified and this is my analysis people can take it or leave it i have identified the key liberal failure right now as a lack of humility and i just don't mean that in in the sense i don't I'm, i don't it sounds like i'm just calling them arrogant but i'm doing it in a backhanded way they can be arrogant, but that's not actually what I'm saying here. I think they have not been willing to admit their own failures. And I think the reason they've done it, and I think, Jen, you were just tongue-in-cheek commenting on this, they've built themselves almost a psychic permission, which is they've spent so much time being worried about um, misinfo and disinfo and uh, bad faith politics and things like that. Not without reason. These are These are genuine concerns. But it's so easy to reject even valid criticism when you're already in the mindset of, of most criticism has been weaponized misinfo by people who just want to destroy democracy. Okay, so and here's... maybe it's until, not. Until they fix that problem, I don't think Mark Carney fixes any problems. Okay, so he, not only do I not think Mark Carney fixes the, their problems, I think he makes it worse. And the reason why I think he makes it worse is the reason why so many Canadians are very, very angry right now. And so very angry, not just with Justin Joe personally, but also with everything that they think Justin Trudeau represents. And what does Justin yeah. Trudeau represent? He, he is an avatar of what I would call an elite technocratic class that has overseen the country for 10 years now, almost 10 years, although this, this problem predates him, but has got certainly gotten worse under him yeah. of 
like this this particular elite class that 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 deems itself most capable and most worthy of running the running the government and running the country has overseen a dramatic decline in quality of life and a dramatic drop off in um, optimism and hope that things will ever get better. Okay. Uh, my position here is that not only does Carney also represent that, he will represent that even to an even greater degree than Justin Trudeau. He will come across as ever more condescending, ever more arrogant and ever more self-assured and, and impervious to any kind of critique. Firstly, secondly, he's a perfect foil for, for, for Polyev. Absolutely perfect foil. Bank of Canada, elite, um, uh, uh, of the same sort of technocratic class. We know best, we know what's best for you. And he's going to come into this job thinking that because he's so smart and so accomplished in so many other areas, that he will be a natural, he'll have a natural gift for, for politics as well. Without realizing that politics in and of itself is a skill set and a skill set mm -hmm. that needs to be learned and can't be learned on the on the fly. I mean, we can criticize Pierre Polyev all you like about the fact that he's a career politician. But one of the upsides of being a career politician is that he's good at politics. He's demonstrably yeah. good at politics. Yep. Um, every single time that you've had Pierre Polyev face Mark Carney in a committee type setting, Pierre Polyev's eaten him alive. It's not even close. Carney, Carney doesn't have, I think he's got a very deep sort of policy understanding, a deep understanding of, of the economic and the business environment. So I think he gets that but he doesn't know how to translate that in a way that's relatable. And I think that he also probably lacks the ability to examine his, the blind spots that he shares. And he shares that with a lot of people in his class. And I think that Pierre understands exactly what Mark Carney is and knows how to eat away and, and attack those blind spots and will do so viciously and effectively. So well, I don't, I don't think that he's, he's a good match. In fact, I think he plays to all of Pierre's strengths in this particular moment of time. And then. The... I, I, no, I think, I think I agree with, with most of that. Um, Mark Carney has been on a book tour mm -hmm. um, and I, I actually had an opportunity to go. I, I wasn't able to make the timing work on the family front to one of his appearances, but I know people who were there and to the last man and woman, everyone who's seen him speak on this book tour has thought he's thoughtful, pleasant, charming, mm -hmm. um, intelligent, uh, well-versed. But I have not heard one person say, and I think he's got that political knack. And I actually want to make a case for Justin Trudeau here. One of the reasons I still think Justin Trudeau is likely to be the liberal leader in the next election is because despite all of his problems, he's he still has strengths. Mm -hmm. And I think there's so much focus on his weaknesses at times that we sometimes forget about his strengths. First of all, he is still good at retail politics. I think he's not as good as he used to be, but he is likely going to be better than the new guy would be g given the amount of relative time they would have to, to get uh, Carney up to speed. And also Justin Trudeau has personal bastions of strength and support in the greater Toronto area and the Montreal area. And one of the problems the liberals have is I don't think they have anyone who they can slot in to replace him who will be as strong in both places. You might be able to find someone who will do better in Toronto than Trudeau will. You might be able to find someone who do better in Montreal than Trudeau will. Will you find someone who will do better than him in both of those places at the same time? No one has shown me who that person would be yet. So Trudeau, he's, I, I, I don't think he's going to win the next election, but purely as a, even if you got to slam that jumbo jet onto the highway tarmac and kind of bottom it out to a stop. And a lot of the passengers get to walk out. I think he's their best bet, maybe not for an election win, but for avoiding a complete wipeout. Okay, so I want to get into Justin Trudeau because a I'm not I'm not sure that a wipeout is avoidable for the Liberals at this point, and I will get into that in a minute. But the one thing the one thing I just wanted to finalize while you were talking about that is I was thinking about the parallel between Pierre Polyev and Mark Carney. Mm -hmm. I don't know how you put those two those two particular men up against one another during an election campaign without being forced to confront something that Canadians don't like to confront, and that's class. Right, the class disparity between these two men is unavoidable, and I think that it's going to raise some really uncomfortable sort of working around questions and and and, and, and assumptions, and it's going to be very uncomfortable for Canadians who don't like to acknowledge that there are, that there are established classes in this country, and actually the 
degree to which the class mobility uh, exists or has corroded is part of the reason why people are angry. I, I don't want to cut you off. I don't know if you were working up to a point there, but I had said at the beginning that I would make the case for Trudeau, but I'd also make the case against him. Okay. Do you want me to do that now, or did you want well, to add a yeah. point? Do we want to pivot to talking about Trudeau specifically and why we think that he will or won't go? Because, I mean, I mean, kind... we can talk Carney to the ends, ends of the earth. I mean, it's, he's an interesting figure to consider. It's an interesting counterfactual to consider. But if Trudeau won't go, then it's, it's you know. Let me, let me make the case for Trudeau going. Okay, make the case for Trudeau going. Now, again, re- reiterating, I think he stays. Yes. Or at the very least, I think I agree with you that at least he wants to. Events may take that out of his hands, and we can't predict that. Mm-hmm. Um, this week has been interesting because the anecdotes are coming at us from two directions. And you and I have to be very careful about this. We can't say anything on the air. But you and I both had interesting anecdotal indicators this week that Justin Trudeau is likely leaving. But I also had one this week that he's likely staying. And I don't know how to make sense of that. And I, therefore, I draw no conclusions. I just go, okay, some of my anecdotal indicators are telling me he's like to leave. Others are telling me he's likely to stay. I throw up my hands. But I did notice something else, and it has nothing to do with Justin Trudeau. I commented to a friend of mine a few days ago who is uh, a conservative in Ottawa. I commented, just as a matter of strategy, I don't know what the liberals are doing right now because they're doing budget and capital gains, but then they're getting in the way of their own messaging there. It takes a week or two to really have a message that can set in and resonate. And then they're on to abortion and then abortion doesn't stick. And then they're on to guns briefly this week. There was some uh, gun amnesty announcement that like fizzled in a day. And then they're on to climate change and drought and forest fires. And they're cycling through their messages so fast, they're getting in their own way. And I, and I commented just to, again, like a politically well-connected uh, Ottawa conservative I know, how long, I asked, does it take a, for like a party to put out a message, to watch it, to see if it's working? And are the liberals moving too quickly from message to message to do that? And I was told they absolutely are, that they aren't giving any of these things time to work. They're getting in their own way. And I said, what is the likely explanation for that? And he told me panic. Mm-hmm. And I and I said, okay, I don't buy that. I don't have the sense that the PMO is panicking. I don't have the sense that the prime minister is panicking. Or maybe everyone around him is. Well, maybe. I think I think, <laughs> look, I have I have definitely picked up whiffs of panic in some of my 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 liberal indicators, but not at a high level. And what my friend said to me was sometimes panic doesn't feel like panic. And sometimes you feel calm, cool, collected, but you're acting irrationally. Hmm. And even if you're projecting confidence and even if you're, you feel in control of a situation, cycling through your messages this quickly isn't rational. It's irrational. They're getting in their own way. And then my friend said to me, I see these guys at the bars and they're like, well, we got a lot of time left, you know, inflation's coming down. They have a good news story in their mind that they've bought into, but they're changing their messaging strategy every three days. Right. They're panicked, but they don't know that they're panicked. And because they don't know that they're panicked, they don't conventionally look like they are. So this is my case against this is Justin deep psychology. This is, do we, do we need to bring in some like Jungian analysis on this one. This is Maybe. great. <laughs> yeah. Oh, also, you and I could squeeze in a little therapy at the same time. And we'll <laughs> build it go. to the line. Um. This is this is what made me think maybe Trudeau will go because mm. there are they, they, look budget didn't work. Nope. Abortion didn't work. Guns ain't working. Alberta's getting torrential rains. So yeah. I think the the, <laughs> the drought's <drought>, out. <laughs> at a certain point, they're already playing the hits. Yeah, and we're potentially a year out from the next election. And we're still, we're, and, and, and also the other thing that I think is also happening is we, we've hit silly season, right? Usually yeah. by June, people are starting to do stupid things in parliament and they, they we're two weeks just, ahead of that, but we're, but we're, yeah, we're, well, in fact, we arguably, we made this point a couple of weeks ago. We're actually four weeks ahead of the normal silly season cycle. 
Um, and you can feel it. Like people are just, they're frazzled. They're not thinking we'll straight talk, anymore. We're going right? to talk about that later in the podcast, but yeah. yes. So the end of all my thinking on this is simply what do they have left to try? And hmm. yeah. And leadership's the only thing left. And again, okay. I, my, my personal view is that would be a mistake. I think Justin Trudeau is their best bet to avoid a complete wipeout the next election. Maybe they, maybe it can't be, but if they have a chance, I think that's it. Okay. But if they, if they're already cycling through all the greatest hits and none of them are working, what else can they do? Okay. So one of the questions that I have after watching Mulcair on CTV talk about Mark Carney, that conservatives are real conservative, real scared of Mark Carney. No, they're not. Um, is that is that is 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 Mulcair an advanced team? Was that just Mulcair talking off the cuff, or is Mulcair basically trying to rally some some liberals to some kind of a caucus spill or caucus revolt? Right, that is sort he of my. Is- he is like a regular CTV contributor. He's oh, a columnist he oh, no, no, no. or pundit I'm not, or something. Yeah, yeah. I'm not saying I'm not saying that 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 he's just shown up out of nowhere. No, he goes. He does. Okay. He does political commentary all the time. That doesn't necessarily refute my point. Um, no. Is he? Is he? Is 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 him putting that out there and saying Carney's the future? Everyone get on board. Is he doing that because out of personal conviction, or is he actually, as I said, a, a kind of political advance team, to, or or is he throwing feelers out yeah. there to see if there's actually interest? or movement on that particular role, right? Um, I mean, Mulcair is an obvious person to do that for the liberals because he's kind of outside the tent. So Mm -hmm. if he can go out and say, liberals, the Mark Carney is the future, there's deniability from within the tent, right? Um, So he's he's a good person to be playing that kind of a functional game within the game. Um, The reason why I think that Trudeau, okay, I I remain pretty fixed on my read of Trudeau's personal psychology that I wrote about a couple of months ago now, which is that I think that Trudeau suffers from a messianic complex. I think he genuinely believes that he and only he can save the party, can save the country from the terrible barbarians at the gates. Um, And I think he genuinely has convinced himself that the criticism that has been leveled against him is all unfair, weaponized, bad faith criticism by misinformation and bad actors. I think that that is a, I'm not even trying to criticize him when I make that observation, because I think that that is a very normal place for for people to be after nine years in power. That is a very, very normal place for people to be when they're bunker bound. It's a very, very normal place to be when your closest advisors have over time basically burned out and left your space. And it's a very, very normal place to be when you don't have critical voices in the room anymore. One thing that I think that I've observed across the political spectrum, people on the right, people on the left, they all seem to fall into this same trap, which is who they, when they get into power, they surround themselves with people who are just like them, right? They don't ever put people in the room who actually will critically challenge them and then cycle those people out. Another problem that we know that Trudeau suffers from is um, inability to delegate inability to actually move power. Everything is is like it was in the Harper government for him. Everything is seems to be from the outside very over centralized, which means it's very hard for the for the government to walk and chew gum at the same time. Um, which means that you have uh, you know an increasingly shrinking and bunker bound inner circle around the Prime Minister's office, radically overwhelmed by what's happening every single day. Um, which sucks for them. I get it. And I kind of can empathize with them, but also I don't understand how somebody could have walked into that government, not understanding that these were the risks they were running and making choices to mitigate for those risks, surrounding themselves with critical thinkers, surrounding themselves with people who will challenge them and actually delegating, understanding that, you know, you personally can't save shit. You know, part of what leadership is, is delegation. That's literally part of the job is being able to identify other people with who were within your organization and structure who can take on leadership and roles and do jobs for you. Um, and that's just something that I, I don't understand why Trudeau's never figured that out. I don't understand why Harper never really figured that out. I don't know if Pierre will figure it out. I hope he does for the sake of the country. <clears throat> um, so anyway, I don't blame him for that. But here's what I said is that I think that with those psychological weaknesses compounding Together, what you have is someone who genuinely buys into his, who's, who, uh, the, the technical thing is, word for it is, huffs his own farts. 
Um, this is a person who's yeah, high the, on his the, own the on his own methane. Academic political lexicon. That's the academic yeah. political lexicon. He's he's stuck huffing his own farts in a in a, in, a, in a very small room with no ventilation. Okay, uh, which means you've left with th- with two options. Either he manages to ride that highly volatile gas into the next election and he gets wiped out. And I I don't. I've never seen someone come back from a sustained twenty point drop and actually pull it off. I, I, I don't, that would be historic from my perspective, but sure. So let's assume that he just gets wiped out. I'm not sure that he can save the furniture bluntly, but even if he does or doesn't, that's where that goes. Um, or option two is essentially caucus says some, somebody within that inner circle manages to get through to him and say, says to him for the good of the party and the good of the country, it's time for you to go, my friend. And maybe, Consider taking a job in Geneva for a couple of years, like give people some space um, and let's not hear from you for three years because everyone needs a break from one another. And there must be a conscious, uncoupl- a conscious of uncoupling between Canada yeah. and Justin Trudeau. Somebody in his inner circle might get through to him and that might force him out. Can't rule that out. The other possibility is uglier and that is there's enough discontent within caucus. It's a full on revolt. There's a full on revolt. And if enough people within caucus just say, fuck this guy, he can't maintain the confidence of the house and it's game over. So I don't think he goes of his own free will. I think it's possible that someone might be able to manipulate him out. And it's also possible that he might be forced out. But here's the flip side of all of that. I don't think the caucus has got the balls. I've seen no sign of it. We've seen no in what, how many years since 2015, what sign have you had to date that Either the Liberal Caucus has balls or has been empowered to have balls. I think that they don't have it. Um, I could be wrong. I mean, if if the caucus revolt comes, my suspicion is that it will come from Atlantic Canada. That seems to be the only group of people who in that space who... I mean, I, that's my guess. Um, and secondly, I'm not sure that anyone can actually reach Trudeau psychologically at this point. I don't think that he has enough people in his inner circle who actually have clout with him so that's kind of where i land on this i i suspect that there's that absent some miscalculation on my part in terms of the state of the liberal caucus or the people in terms the people surrounding him i don't see any way out that being said i still think the odds that he goes into the next election at this point are 50 50 because i i'm completely open to my own miscalculation and my own misreading on this so i'd say 50 50 even even odds I don't know how to evaluate the possibility of either of those scenarios you laid out. Mm-hmm. Like, and like, no, we're I, still I, on the outside. We're just we're on the outside looking in, do, doing yeah, what but we can it, with, with that, anecdotal sure, rumor. But it's also there's a long time to go. It's a long time to go, and well, I, that's actually the real question: How long can the Liberal Caucus continue tolerate at this, being down? Continue to, to tolerate point? this, and how long can 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 Parliament manage this level of stupidity and silly season stuff? We will, like, we will talk about that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, right. I've got two points to make on this and we'll move okay, on. And they're, sure. they're both relatively brief. One of them is that you, what you call fart huffing. I have, I actually have kind of an identical term, but mm-hmm. it's just less crass. Their feedback loop is broken. Well, but mine's so much more colorful. It's memorable. It's memorable. No, but I, I think for our purposes, I would say the problem they have is that their feedback loop is broken. Part of it is that they've broken it themselves by thinking that criticism is misinfo or disinfo. Part of it, I think to your point is what after nine years, anyone's feedback loop is broken. That's just the way it goes. So I'm very sympathetic in a weird way on that front. Uh, The other point I would make, and this is an interesting one talking about burnout and, and being in the bunker I don't want to talk about this at length because I'm not, I'm not an expert on the issue, but I don't know if you saw this when you were in the States. The CRA apparently expects tenants of non-resident landlords. Yes. So this is like an arcane hundred-year-old provision in the, in, in, in the tax code that recently was discovered. And to me, I seized on this. I didn't write about this. I didn't talk about it. I didn't really care about the issue. But I looked at that. And I was like, oh, okay. This is stupid, and mm-hmm. this is something that the federal government is going to fix. But it was interesting to me because it gave us an opportunity to time how long it took for them 
Mm -hmm. to realize that. Mm -hmm. So for me, I needed about 15 seconds to like read the story and go, this is bad policy. This is going to hurt people. And it's politically radioactive for the government. Mm -hmm. So it's not going to stay. This is going to get yeah. fixed. Yeah. How long does it take for them to realize it? It was about a week. Yeah. And that, that to me is such an interesting little case study. And I, I've made this point about a billion times before. One of the things that keeps killing this government is their processing time. From threat detection to threat perception to threat analysis to threat reaction. Well, not so too long. There's a whole process of like denial as well in there as well. Well, this isn't actually a real problem because blah, 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 blah. And then and I, don't I say know. The, the CRA one was really interesting because it's a minor problem and an easy fix, right? There will have to be a legislative fix. But in the meantime, all the government had to do is what they did, which is to say the CRA, don't do this. We'll fix yeah. it, but stop doing this for now. And that still took, I'd have to actually look at a timeline to get this right. And the written dispatch will get it worked out to the day. But that to me was fascinating because this was one of those, this is a big deal. It's dangerous to you and there's no defense of it. And it still took them a week to yeah. get from it coming up to them acting on it. So yeah, and then, then you look at like big, complicated problems. This, this problem compounds on itself. Well, anyway, this I think is we, how you we've... end up with COVID, right? The risk to Canada is low, Canada even if people are buying up every roll of toilet paper. Yeah. Anyway, I think that that is all we have to say about the issue of will Trudeau stay or will he go? I think that we've we definitively answered it. <laughs> we've definitively <laughs> answered it. Take that to the bank, bookies. Yeah. And, like um, and subscribe for like more of that subscribe. keen analysis. <laughs> keen, definitive analysis. There you go. This episode of The Line has been brought to you by Unsmoke Canada, which is dedicated to helping Canadians who are looking to quit smoking understand the full range of options available. Despite decades of government programs and regulations, today nearly 5 million Canadian adults smoke cigarettes. Adult smokers who choose to continue to smoke should be aware that other options exist. Right now, accessing information about these options is heavily restricted in Canada. While not risk-free, alternatives such as heated tobacco and vaping products provide a potentially less harmful choice than cigarettes. Cigarettes burn tobacco, resulting in smoke that contains 6,000 harmful chemicals that are associated with smoking-related disease and death. Heating tobacco and vaping products have the potential to significantly reduce this risk. Health agencies around the world are now considering these alternatives to help end smoking. Updated laws can help adult smokers better understand the full range of options available, including the relative risk of these products. Millions of Canadians smoke cigarettes. Technology exists that can help change that, but policymakers need to take action. Learn about how a smoke-free future can be achieved at unsmoke.ca. So this next one got me a little annoyed. Okay. Okay. Oh, also, I should say, apologize to all the line subscribers. I know you've criticized me in the past for talking too fast, and I definitely talked too fast in that last segment. Don't blame me. It's because I'm having afternoon coffee. I'm really sorry. I will try to do better. Yeah, it's it's the coffee. Sure. Yep. What mm -hmm. are you implying, that granny? Oh, nothing. It's just, just that it must be the coffee. It's good to the last drop. All right. So... This I week, international from tea recently. I'll have you know, sir. What's I that? Switched back from tea. Thank you. I was doing tea for like a year and a half, and now I'm, I'm back a tea on man. coffee. I will drink coffee. I don't hate coffee, but I'm a default tea man. Always have. Mm. That's how I party. This is very important analysis that you yeah. need. Scintillating content. You use. Hashtag content. Um, <laughs> all right. So this week, the International Criminal Court announced uh, is seeking arrest warrants against senior Hamas and Israeli leadership. And I'm not going to talk about that. Okay. Uh, it's a complicated issue, and I have not really had the chance yet to, to sit down and actually read the charges. So I'm not going to pretend that I'm an instant expert on this. Sure. But one of the things that I thought was interesting, and I don't mean to pick on Nate, but he, he had the definitive tweet that I saw was uh, Nate Erskine-Smith, Liberal MP. Um, there has been debate uh, among the international community about whether or not the charges against Israeli leadership are appropriate. For instance, the United States has reacted very badly. Some European countries have already said if Mr. Netanyahu steps foot on their soil, they will arrest him. So it's a debate. What should Canada do? And again, I'm not going to talk about that. I, I need to read more before I come up with a decision. 
Well, one of the things I thought was really interesting, um, and I don't remember the, the words verbatim here, but obviously in the video version, we'll just throw them right up on the screen, um, was Nate had said, and by the way, I, I like Nate. I get to, that's Everyone my likes bias. Nate. He's like the no, only, I, he's the only in, actually independent, like liberal MP that they have, man, which is why he's we, probably leaving. Also, we have mutual friends. I've gotten to know him a little bit. Like, I like the guy. But yeah. he had a tweet, which again, we'll throw up on the screen, uh, where he had said, you know, if if we have a rules-based international order, we, that includes living up to the, the ICC or, or whatever. Are you ready for my response? Are you ready? I'm ready for your response. We don't. Thank you for coming to my TED Talk. We do not have a rules-based international order. We just don't. And I, I would love to have one. I'm too old to be of military age now. My kids are next up. I, I am personally and directly invested in a world where all disputes are resolved by bureaucrats in New York or Geneva. I am tangibly all in on that idea. That hasn't, that hasn't really worked out so well. That, that hope that that's, that I, I may I've been be... disappointed. <laughs> all right. Like, the hope of that has not fully lived up to my expectations. And one of the things that just drives me insane about this topic is that we in Canada, with our heads rammed right down our own belly buttons, I, I almost went a different direction, but I'll go with belly buttons. We have these debates completely in an academic abstract vacuum where I, I tweeted after Nate's tweet, basically, we don't. We can aspire to one, but we don't have one. And people are like, well, we have to act like one if there is to be one, or maybe it's not perfect, but we need to, uh, we need to, we need to work in this direction. One particularly brilliant gentleman said to me, we do have a rules-based international order, Matt. It's just that no one abides. Then we oh, don't. Then, then oh, we don't. Great. That's right. Then we don't have Guess one. Guess what? I have a fucking blender. It doesn't blend shit, but I've got a blender. Like, fuck off. You Sorry. don't have a blender. You have, you I'm sure have he's a, a, nice a paperweight at that point. I'm sure he's a nice guy. Yeah. What I always think when I find myself having these kinds of debates is let's translate them into Rohingya or Hebrew or Arabic or Ukrainian or any of the African dialects in the parts of the world where there are ethnic cleansing ha campaigns happening right the fuck now. And let's go ask these people to respond to the tweets where Canadians talk about the rules-based international order. Let's just read it to them. Let's go, let's go to occupied Ukraine and say, hey, Canadian MP Nate Erskine-Smith thinks it's important we have a, a rules-based international order. And just stick a microphone in their space and get, say your response. Let's go to Gaza where everything's been bombed into fucking rubble. Let's go to the south of Israel and the north of Israel, where people still can't go home. Let's go to any of the places in, uh, in, in Asia where Rohingya refugees are living. Let's go to Central Africa. Matt, I think that you have, just... you have, you've articulated a beautiful, the line international tour. I think that we should do it. Let's, let's start spot. Let's start getting some money going for a fundraiser. A different fucking insurance policy. <laughs> Saying, I'm saying, let's go to these places and let's ask them that exact question. One clip. There you go. Um, okay, so here's my only position on this is that again, I I share the 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 love of the beautiful ideal of a world's world's world based order, and and I think that you know we in the West have a disproportionate uh, I should say this a requirement, moral requirement to live up to that order because I think we in the West are disproportionately benefited by that basic skeleton of an order but a rules-based international order that can't be enforced doesn't exist and right now there is no enforcement mechanism for it. it's like saying that canada exists in the is, is it ha, has a rules-based national order but then getting rid of all of the police forces rcmp and and municipal police forces and mech and mechanism and courts no, you know they just um, quiet quit 
yeah, yeah, or yeah, exactly. Like what 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 happens to our uh, to the the ideal of our rules based international order if there is no entity that maintains the legitimate use of violence in order to enforce that order? And you can it's make what the argument: when your blender won't blend. Well, exactly, and this is and and we can make the argument: well, the the UN maintains the legitimate use of violence through peacekeeping. I was like, well, have you looked into that? <laughs> yeah, but again, we'll translate that into Ukraine. <laughs> you know, have have you looked into how effective peacekeeping has actually proved to be in 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 the long run? Because it's it's not not, not, not great, not great, not a great uh, track record. And there's a reason why pretty much all of the Western nations, save France, have more or less decided to outsource peacekeeping to well to poorer nations who've turned it into essentially a, a, a mercenary force. A racket, for yeah. A racket, right? They bill the UN a per diem rate for their soldiers higher than they pay the soldiers. That's right. Uh, so this becomes a this is a, this is a money making exercise on, on, at, at the expense of of, of essentially well meaning Westerners who like the idea of peacekeeping uh, regardless of its actual outcomes. I mean, but then half these it, peacekeeping forces show up and just become another one of the participants in the ethnic cleansing and rape campaigns. That's right. Um, so look, I, I, we're we're coming up to the end of where idealism functions in the real world, we're and past I think it. it we're, we're past just in it. the echo. We're just in the echo of it. And like yeah. I said, if you want to establish a rules based international order, like the ICC, that's great. But if you Pony don't up, have motherfuckers, get me an army. That's right. If you don't actually have an army or some kind of uh, extrajudicial sort of not extrajudicial, but sort of uh, extraterritorial police force to enforce those rules, really what you're relying on is 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 nation states who will operate within their own interest within what's left of that ideal, right? And that's what we're that's where we are right now. So it's it's and also I think that also establishing a, an an international army or an international police force of some kind would be met with extraordinary opposition by everyone everybody right no one everybody. thinks it's nobody a good wants idea. to do that nobody nobody wants to do that nobody wants to cede their own sovereignty and their own their own power in this circumstance to something resembling a rules-based order so that leaves us here <laughs> thanks there was a period in the late 20th century a little bit into the early 21st century where you could believe that a rules-based international order had established itself, but it did so. It did so at the indulgence of the countries that have the, the military power and either the political, the economic, or the ideological desire to wage war, because mm -hmm. they just didn't. There was an agreement for a period of time that they weren't, and that consensus has been destroyed in the last two years. And people who sincerely believe in the rules-based international order, not only as an aspirational thing, but as, a, as, as something that exists, they may view the last two years as a, a blip, an aberration. I would posit to them that if you zoom out historically, what you see is that the post-Second World War period was the historical aberration, hmm. where you had the United States being an almost unparalleled global superpower combined with two I relatively neatly divided ideological blocks that held themselves mutually hostage through mutually assured nuclear destruction. Those were the days. Wish we could go back to that. <laughs> oh, we, we may yet. <laughs> oh, wait. Um, Except it'll but... be messier, because in this case, it's not going to be two nice, tidy little blocks. It's going to be like 50 different nuclear powers holding each other to account. It's going to be great. The real decentralization of power, democratization in power, in, in act. Yay. The, the rules-based international order. The, the idea that there are still people who... Look, I, I would like to think we would approach nearly 100% unanimous agreement that that would be a good thing. I'm only positing that it is not currently a thing. <laughs> and I think that's an important distinction we should have. And you know, yesterday, a very smart uh, gentleman was arguing with me on Twitter about this and saying, t talking about you're ignoring the existence of international law. I'm not. Yes. So does, so does, so Russia does a lot is. of people. <laughs> what? Like, no, that's, yeah, yeah. International like, law is a. Uh, it's a thing. That's a thing I, that 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 exists. I I would encourage, but actually not encourage. The next time any of you find yourself, God forbid, being mugged, to indulge in the thought process of the Canadian intelligentsia 
and explain to the person with the gun aimed at you, but sir, this is illegal. <laughs> boom. Mic drop moment. Or perhaps it's the boom of you getting shot in the goddamn chest. Rules-based international order. I look if we if can't you even s- agree to cut our carbon emissions, yeah. but we'll ban war. Okay. Things are great. Things are great. Like look, if you if you support the ideal of a rules-based international order, do like and subscribe to live. <laughs> We're very cheerful here today. Mm. I feel great. Great feel mood. Great. Mm-hmm. Feeling good. International rules-based order. That's that's like what the international rules-based order will do for you. Like and subscribe. Like and subscribe. I feel I feel much better now. Feel, we took you, a... you felt you felt like you got that off your yeah. chest now. Yeah. 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 You feeling yeah. a little a little calmer, a little chill. Oh yeah. Feel, feel yeah. feeling good. Got that. Feeling great. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Be best. Look, to just quote just the just think just lady. think of like just think of how beautiful a country you have to live in to be able to point this out. You know what I mean? Like, just think about the generations of peace and prosperity that are required to create an intelligentsia that is that, that believes in a rules-based disc- international order. Yeah. It's actually, it's kind of beautiful. Like in its own way, it's, it's a beautiful thing that we've lived in the gener in we've lived in a country that we have and enjoyed the privileges and peace that we have yep. that allow us the highest, the access to the highest ideals that we have and to believe them. And let's go explain them to the villagers of eastern Ukraine, to the kibbutzim in southern Israel, and what's left of the population of Gaza. Okay. Let's go. T- let's go spread the gospel in the Rohingya refugee camps. Rules based. Well, hey, look, if the rules based international order had worked, none of those things would exist. You know, I'll, we'll move on here because we only got a few minutes left, and there's one more topic to do. But the, I, sh- I, I can't laugh at this because it's too sad. Okay. But. But we'll with, try. We'll try to laugh at the really sad things because that's the only way we make it. With my sense of irony fully intact. Okay. I saw a, re- a tweet from Global Affairs Canada mm-hmm. this week. Mm-hmm. And I don't know if it was tweeted oh, no. at the time or if it was a retweet. Oh, no. Oh, no. But, but while I was debating whether or not the rules-based international order exists, Global Affairs Canada, with typical Canadian bureaucratic aplomb, was noting with concern renewed violence against Rohingya. Mm. And I didn't want to get in trouble and I was pretty pissed off. So I, d- I chose not to tweet about it, but part of me wanted to simply quote, retweet it and say, it's okay. It's going to be fine. Nothing to worry about. The rules-based international order will take care of that. Let's all go get a coffee or pardon me, a tea. I'm think, a team man. Uh, <laughs> moments like this, it's a good thing that you're a team man. Tea okay, all right, all right, all right. Look, we're not gonna, we're not going to um, wallow in our quasi cynical feelings oh, about forbid. the rules space. God forbid yeah, that. The all thought. right. Okay, so what's the next topic, Matt? I totally forgot what our last topic was going to be. Oh, it's it's. Honestly, we might have gotten the sequence in the podcast wrong. Maybe we should have talked about this after all the Trudeau speculation. Well, but... too late now. <clears throat> yeah, Just wrap no, it up like committed. a bow. You got to, you got to, you got to end where you begin. Classic columnist structure. Yeah, you know what? We we failed to adhere to the rules based podcast order. <laughs> um, this week in the House, uh, there was an interesting moment where uh, the Speaker had uh, directed Christopher Freeland, Finance Minister and Deputy Prime Minister, to withdraw remarks after. She, um, Pierre Polyev had asked a question about a very loaded and sendery question of like, will the liberals admit that they are intending to legalize hard drugs or words to that effect? And she stood up and is a Mr. Speaker, the opposition leader is wearing more makeup than I am. And then the speaker made her with apologize and withdraw the remark, uh, saying we don't comment on members and, and Ms. Freeland did apologize and withdraw. It's a weird insult, so I think we can just add that to the list. I, I think she was trying to say that he's a fake or a phony or a fraud. I don't honestly know. I think that's where she was going. Can we just add this to the list of evidence that Christopher Freeland has no actual political skills? 
Yes, I think that the the extent of that list is now. Yeah, that the the extent of that list is pretty wide. So this is a really weird one because you do see this one bubbling up through liberal po- proxy people on Twitter and various other social medias. It's a really weird hyper fixation with beautiful Justin Trudeau and um, Pierre Polyev, who's like like not great looking kind of thing. This idea and this I, I, the one meme I'm thinking of is this this one that points out that uh, Pierre Polyev spent three million dollars on this on this um, uh, makeover and it's a picture of Pierre Polyev and it's like his shirt's hanging out. And unlike Justin Trudeau just shows up and looks like this, you know what I mean? And I think that this is rooted in the idea that uh, part of the liberal appeal, liberals appeal and part of Justin Trudeau's appeal, especially in 2015 is that he cut a really uh, traditionally attractive figure against Mulcair and Harper at the time, right? Like these were two kind of older footy duddy kind of typical Canadian politician types. And then you have, Trudeau who comes in and he looks like he he belongs on the cover of Vogue and did show up in Vogue, right? Like he's a, he's a conventionally very attractive man. And I think they're trying to draw that contrast again in order to play to his looks, Um, which on one hand, look, I don't have a problem with the political party playing to the assets they have. Justin Trudeau is, uh, I guess, conventionally attractive. I don't, I don't dispute that. I just think that as a woman, I have a problem with this because Justin Trudeau is really not my type. And anyone who's seen my husband will be able to understand that. <laughs> like, I don't know what to tell you. Like, like I don't like pretty men. I, I don't think that I'm unique in, in my gender or age group for this. I like men who look like men, you know, like, er, er, you know, like They're I kind of with- like, I like, look, I like men who look like they can build a cabin and throw me over their shoulder. Like it's, I don't know if this is a Canadian female thing. Am I, am I TMI here? I'm sorry. Um, but trust her to know is never no. my type because I don't, I don't want a man who's prettier than me. Like what, what is, <laughs> I don't, I have no desire for this. I'm a solid seven out of 10. I don't want, I don't want an eight or a nine. I want a six or a five. You know what I'm saying? A six or a five. That's funny and smart. That's, that's where I live. Um, you took this in a wildly different direction <laughs> than I was going. Uh, we'll know, circle back to the whole cabin look, thing later. But anyway, the point I'm trying to make here, the point I'm trying to make here is that I think that they're 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 trying to. I don't know if it's a draw draw a contrast to his to Pierre Polyev's apparent fakeness. I don't know if they were trying to emasculate him, or I don't know if they were trying to draw this comparison to make him seem less attractive because they think that his appeal is rooted in this idea that women find Pierre Polyev attractive. <laughs> Personally. If a woman were to find Polyev attractive, it has a lot more to do with how he treats his wife than how he actually looks or whether or not he wears makeup. I mean, lots of people in public fig- public spaces wear makeup. I mean, that's that's very normal. Uh, if you're under lights, if you're under cameras, if you do any kind of TV work, you're going to be male or female, you're going to be put a little powder on you. That's that's very normal. Um, so I. I, I don't I don't understand where she was going with that or what she was trying to do, but I do think that there's this weird liberal undercurrent fixation that's trying to harken back to Trudeau's superior physical appearance. And I, I think that's a really weird place to go and a very in, ineffective one. I, th- I think that's probably all valid. Uh, I, 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 Look, just, I, would, I appreciate you validating my sexual preferences. Okay, Matt? I just, I that's, would like that's that. That's all I do day in and day out of the line. Um <laughs> Co-founder and sexual preferences validator. It's on my mm-hmm. business card. Mm-hmm. Um, I, yeah, look, you you took that in a more thoughtful direction than I was going to go. So I'll, I'll respond. Is, is thoughtful the right word for that? Because I'm not sure I did. <laughs> I'm not sure I took that in a thoughtful direction. Uh, okay. I'm gonna re- thought provoking. <laughs> um, I, I will I will respond in in a similar spirit, and I will say that. I, be, I agree that for Christopher Freeland, it, first of all, again, as I said, yet more proof she's terrible as a politician. As a politician, I'm not saying she's a terrible cabinet minister, but her, her actual political ability is basically zero. But this was also, to me, and I'm you know me, I'm not a pearl clutcher, but this was an interesting thing for her to do because I think it actually exposed her to risk. First of all, if it is, I don't know what her intentions were, and I'm not going to presume to. But if it does end up being perceived as an effort to emasculate or, or feminize the opposition leader, well, that's off brand for the liberals. Mm-hmm. And I, so I think that's a possible problem. I also think the liberals have been attempting to hold themselves up as the adults in the room. Mm-hmm. That's a problem for the liberals. Mm-hmm. And I think last and not least, 
I think Polyev's question was loaded and torqued. And he had also had a tweet earlier in the week where he like explicitly blamed Justin Trudeau for 42,000 overdose deaths. Mm -hmm. I think that's bullshit. Mm -hmm. I think that's provocative, but like not in a good way. Like, I think that is, I I don't think he should do that. And I think, I wish he would stop. I think it's bullshit. I know he won't stop. But I also then think that was a liberal, an opportunity for the liberals to take the high road. And instead, when Pierre Polyev asked a question, even a loaded and torqued one about overdose deaths, Christian Freeland went where she did with that. And that was an opportunity to scorch him on a valid point, which is that he has been making light of this issue, that he has been politicizing overdose deaths, that he is not serious about offering solutions. All of those, I think, are valid criticisms. Mm -hmm. Instead... She made a makeup jab. So that is me responding thoughtfully. But let me actually give you just what my really quick reaction is. It's to repeat what we've been saying over the last couple of weeks. They're exhausted. They're grumpy. And the hate, the personal animosity is spilling over. And I don't know how we're going to do this for another 18 months without driving ourselves insane. And I honestly not convinced we're not insane already. Oh, we definitely are. We're absolutely nuts. I just went on a five minute ramble about how I like bears. I mean, we're all completely insane. But the other thing I was going to say, and again, tying it beginning to the ending, you know what that says to me? Now that you mention it, it's panic. That's panic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, I read um, read a book years ago. It was a novel and it was, um, there's this great scene that I I won't describe it at length because I know we're really tight on time, Mm -hmm. but there was this line of dialogue Uh, that that has always stuck with me where a man is recounting years after a tragedy he's being interviewed by reporters about about a tragedy and he was in the room when the tragedy was occurring and he said with hindsight i can now see the moment we lost control of the situation but we still felt like we were in control Mm -hmm. there was still a sense of calm there were protocols and proceeds and people were making phone calls and we were working and we we were still all speaking to each other very reasonably but we had actually lost control of the situation already. It, it had gotten away from us and the tragedy was now inevitable, but it didn't feel like that. Mm. And when my conservative friend this week in Ottawa had told me that they're panicking, but they don't know that they're panicking, that's what came to mind. Yep. That with hindsight, they in, might in, look in, back. In and two go, years, Whoa. yeah, in two years, they're going to be able to look back on themselves and go, like, wow, we would lost the plot, but they're not there now. All right, Matt, I think we got to put it. Put a pin in it right there. I got to pick up my kids. I think you got to yeah, go pick Tim's up your kids. Get up to the cabin. It's all good. It's all good. But anyway, I just wanted to once again say thank you and like and subscribe to the and live. And check out our, our link below for our Edmonton event. We hope to see you there. We still have a few tickets left, but we sold a bunch this week. Yeah, we did. They're, okay. they're selling out pretty well. Okay. So there are still some left, but get them. And uh, Jen and I hope to see you in Alberta's capital. And as always, like and subscribe. Like and subscribe. Today's podcast was brought to you by Unsmoke Canada. Now is the time to modernize Canadian laws so that adult smokers have information and access to better alternatives. By doing so, we can create lasting change. Learn more at unsmoke.ca.